great song to end on, Have Your Way in Me. Amen, oh me? Amen, huh? Before we get to it, I just want to kind of re-highlight uh, baptism. If you've never been baptized, you have an opportunity. We're going to have a class right after the service that's going to be meeting in the uh, old building. And uh, that's the first thing that Jesus asked us to do, by the way. If, if you call yourself a, a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, then the greatest way you can honor him is by following in baptism. That's what he asks us to do. So if you've never been baptized, but you consider yourself a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, then please, this class is for you. It'll be taking place for about 10 minutes after, and it'll be in the old building. So I just want to invite you to that. Um, I certainly appreciate Ruthie's uh, prayer on offering, huh? On the offer, well, you know, about the worship thing and then digging deep into your wallet, you know. We're giving, t we're giving her 10% of the offering. That's why she did that. So, no, 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 I'm just kidding. I'm just that's not going to happen. But she, she kind of gives a segue into the opening uh, here. And there, were, there was this minister, there was this pastor, and he, he got up and he said to his congregation, now I have three messages in my hands. The first message will cost you $100, but it will only last for 10 minutes. The next message will cost you $50, and it will last for 15 minutes. The third message I have in my hand will cost you $10, but it's going to last an hour. Now, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward, and they're going to take an offering, okay? And so the ushers take the offering. You know, they play the offertory song, and then the, after the offertory song, the minister gets back up, and he says, the ushers have just informed me that you chose the hour message. <laughs> it means it was a low offering. See, it's 10 <laughs> See. The punchline, see, you're going to get the hour message because you only gave $10 on, okay. Well, you know, when I was in seminary, they never had a class on telling jokes, so you can't, you know, do not blame the seminary for that. All right, this morning, now that we're over the silliness, I want to get to the book of Ephesians and the study on the book of Ephesians, and I've entitled the message this morning, Are You Wise or Unwise? wise or unwise. Father, I just thank you for the gift of no humor, Lord. <laughs> but it's good to get a laugh. And I thank you for each and every person here. I believe that you've called them here this morning, Lord. And I'm just asking now, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are welcome here. And I'm asking that you would give each one of us here soft hearts, including myself, just soft hearts to receive your word, your word can bring life. And I believe that's what the intention is this morning. I ask that you would give us ears to hear what your word is really saying. And I ask that you would fill me from the soles of my feet to the crown of my head. And that I would truly just speak your words. And much life, I, I, I pray that actually chains will be broken this morning. I pray that chains will be broken this morning and there will be freedom in the house. And so I'm just looking expectantly what you're going to accomplish now, Lord, and I just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Skip, can you play the video? <laughs> Tragically, there's probably far too much truth in that, isn't there? And maybe you've wondered why, you know, uh, God doesn't work. I love that as a pastor when I hear that. You know, pastor, God just doesn't work. Translation meaning that God isn't giving me what I want. Has it ever occurred to you that God is being gracious and not answering your prayer? Has it ever occurred to you that God is being gracious and not answering your prayer? You see, the God of the universe is a loving God, and he doesn't want you in bondage, and he doesn't want me in bondage. God wants us free, and that's what I want us to see this morning. We're going to tackle some tough topics but I want you to understand that God really wants you and I to be set free. So the Apostle Paul writes this morning, Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 15. Skip, can you put those verses up? So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. 
Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. You know, when it's all said and done, do you know what will really matter? What will really matter when you are standing before the Lord of glory is, did you and did I live a wise life or did we live an unwise life? Did you live wisely or did you live unwisely? Paul's first going to tackle the unwise person. So Skip, let's look at chapter 5 of Ephesians starting, I believe, at verse 3. Here he says this. So this is the unwise person. Let there be no sexual immorality impurity or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world, Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. This is the unwise person. Paul uses four very powerful words to describe the unwise person. First of all, he says in verse 3 that the unwise person is sexually immoral. Sexually immoral. Now, I can already imagine what some of you are thinking. There they go again. There go those Christians. There goes that Christian God. He's just a killjoy. He's just against sex and he's against fun. Just for just you know, just to lay it out here this morning, I want you to know that God is pro-sex. He invented it. He did. I mean, God is pro-sex. He invented it. But you need to know that. Sexual intimacy is a very, very powerful thing. It can either do tremendous good or it can do tremendous destruction. And the reason why it is so powerful is because during sexual intimacy, you've got all of these endorphins, these pleasure endorphins going off in your brain, and it makes it a very pleasurable act. And you might ask, why would God make the sexual act so pleasurable and the short answer is this is the goal of God is to bind together the man and the woman in even a greater and greater fashion in fact God's goal is that a man and a woman a man and a woman that they become one And the goal, really, of sexual intimacy is to make that unity even greater. He doesn't want you just to bind it together in terms physically, but also emotionally and spiritually. And so when someone just indiscriminately is having sex, when you're just hooking up, what you are doing is you are creating a union, you are binding yourself to that person. In fact, the Apostle Paul describes it this way in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. Skip, can you put that up starting at verse 15? Now, listen to what he says. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. For the scriptures say the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one in spirit with him. Run. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must, you must honor God with your body. You know, the sexual sin, the sexual sin is a unique sin because it involves another person. And what you are doing is you are uniting yourself to that person. You know, so often I will hear as a pastor, come on, pastor, this is the 21st century now. you got to be kidding me. What is the big deal about having sex with another person? What is the big deal about 
hooking up. I mean, really, I mean, if it's two consensual adults and nobody gets hurt, what's the big deal? Well, you see, if you really understand how God designed us, you do get hurt. Both people get hurt. Because you see, when you have sexual intimacy with someone, you are uniting yourself to that person physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You're in a sense, you're you're uniting souls together. Someone does get hurt. And when you have sex with someone outside of marriage, you're giving a piece of yourself You're literally giving a piece of yourself that you're going to lose because that person's going to go on and have sex with someone else and unite that part of you to someone else even. And I am absolutely convinced one of the great reasons why here we are in the blessed land of plenty, yet we are so depressed, yet we are are, are just so despondent. We're seeing psychologists and psychiatrists. The reason why we're having such emotional problems is because we don't understand we're destroying our souls by just having indiscriminate sex. A wise person doesn't do that. Secondly, let's move on to what an unwise person does. Paul says that an unwise person is involved in impurity. Can you go back, skip to that? There it is, impurity. Literally, the Greek word means filth. Filth. What does it mean to be involved in filth? Well, you, uh, you know how I love to say, you know, when it comes to interpretation, context, context, context. What's verse 4 say, Skip? Here is what it means to talk about impurity. Paul says, Impure people are involved in obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, there is to be thankfulness to God. You know, as as I was just reading it, obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. That pretty much sums up America, doesn't it? No, really. It sums up our conversations. How about television? I remember, like, what was it, the 80s? You You know what the number one show was? Anybody know and remember? Beavis and Butthead. Now, there's a good show for you. How about Homer Simpson? How about Saturday Night Live? I mean, we are just full of filth. Think about the books that we read, the movies that we read. You could say that America is a purveyor of filth. Now, wonder, you know, our society is just drowning right now. We are absolutely full of of just what Ephesians 4, 5, 4 times. We're, we're, as a country, sadly, I mean, we are so unwise. I mean, just, I mean, I, I was sad. I actually, how many here did actually watch the debate of the Republican Party on Thursday night? That was a tragedy. I mean, I was embarrassed. You talk about course, you've got presidential candidates who are a bunch of high school boys. I mean, I was absolutely astounded at what was going on. And you know what? It's, it's interesting, and I, I, I remember this. I, I didn't grow up a Christian. But, you know, as I was looking back on the jokes we used to tell in the locker room, most of them had to do with what? The body, didn't it? The human body. And we would make fun of bodily functions, you know, and whatnot. And how tragic. Paul says, if I am a believer, that's not for you, he said. He said, what? Why Paul says this? Because there should be thankfulness to God. What should we be thankful for contextually? What's in view is the human body. You know, think about the human body if you have a regenerate mind. It's a beautiful thing. You can see. Look at you can see, you can hear, you can smell, you can touch. You're even given a brain. You can think. Now, after the presidential debate, I'm not so sure, but you know, I mean, seriously. It says the psalmist says, We're fearfully and wonderfully made. Yet, you know, the degenerate mind, and I used to have a degenerate mind. I'm sorry to say, my mind was in the gutter. And I used to make fun of the human body. I used to make fun of the human body. But see, the wise person, the regenerate person, they now see the human body. They see life, and they go, wow, God, you are awesome. You are incredible. I can't believe what you made. That's the difference between a wise and an unwise person. Paul moves on thirdly, though, about the unwise person. Can you put up Philippians? There it is, our Ephesians 5, 3. He said that an unwise person is also greedy. An unwise person is also greedy. I find that interesting. Do you remember the definition? We went over greedy several weeks ago. Do you know what it means to be greedy? It means that you have the desire for more and more and more, but you're never satisfied. 
Doesn't that describe the average American? I mean, we're the number one consumer in the world. We're always wanting more and more and more, yet we're never satisfied. And you know what's even tragic? I hear preachers in the pulpit actually purporting this and actually encouraging people and saying, you know, hey, if you have enough faith, just get it. Just claim it. And, 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 and we're going after more and more things. And no, no, that's the unwise person. we got too many pastors in America that are unwise. The wise person, though, does this. We looked at it last week. 1 Timothy chapter 6 says this in uh, verses 6 through 8. Yet true, now watch this. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all. We brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if you have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Madison Avenue. Commercials. Do you know what the goal of Madison Avenue is? It's to make you discontent. Millions and millions and millions of dollars are designed to make you discontent with your life. Do you know what the message of Madison Avenue is, commercials? One more thing. One more thing, and then you're going to be happy. If you just got that tube of toothpaste and you had that white, pearly white smile, whoo, then you'd be happy. If you just had that car, just got that car, wow, then you'd be happy. If you just changed your beer, you know, if you quit, quit the lousy Budweiser and, and go to Coors Life, wow, then you would be happy. And I mean, we bite down on that lie. We bite down on that lie. And the believer is supposed to be content. See, the unwise person is always discontented with their life. The wise person is actually content with their life. And here's why. Here's why the believer can be contented. Skip, can you put up those verses by Solomon? 3,000 years ago, King Solomon wrote a book called Ecclesiastes. 3,000 years ago. Now, if you want to make a lot of money and you're a writer, take Ecclesiastes and move it up to date. Just move it up to date. This is the book for America today. I mean, it would sell like hotcakes. And here's what Solomon said 3,000 years ago. Some people work wisely with knowledge and skill, then must leave the fruit of their efforts to someone who hasn't worked for it. You know who that is? That's your kids, okay? This, too, is meaningless. He says it's a, me watch it. he says it's a great tragedy. <laughs> it's a tragedy. So what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. Even at night, their minds cannot rest. It is all all meaningless. So I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. Then I realized that these pleasures are from God. For who can eat, now watch this, for who can eat or drink or enjoy anything apart from him. God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy to those who? God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to those who? But if a sinner, unwise person, becomes wealthy, God takes the wealth away and gives it to those who please him. You know, God has stacked the deck against you and me. Do you realize that? God has stacked the deck against us. And you can continue to pursue more and more and more and more, and guess what? You'll never be satisfied. In that, I mean, it's almost like a cruel joke God plays on the American public. We just continue to buy more and more, and all you have is clutter. Do you realize studies have been done that the more stuff you have, the unhappier you are? Things don't make you happy. People do. Things will not bring you fulfillment in life. People do. Relationships do. First for a relationship with God and then relationships with people. You know what I pray now? If, here, if you're a wise person, I pray in the morning. I said, Lord, I just forgive me. Forgive me for my greediness. Forgive me when I want this and I want that and I want another thing. I know I have sinned against you, Lord. What I am asking you for, and I repent of that, what I'm asking you for is that you would give me the gift of contentment. Help me to enjoy my spouse. 
Help me to enjoy my children. Help me to enjoy my job that I grouse about all the time. Help me to enjoy the house that you've given me. Help me to enjoy the cars that you've given me. Help me to enjoy the material items that you've given me. I don't need more, Lord. I need the gift of enjoyment. Wow. And you know what? God would answer that prayer. You would tickle him pink. The unwise person is always saying, I'm one thing away from happiness. The wise person is seeking the gift of enjoyment. All right. Now, it's verse 6 that should terrify us. Skip, can you put it up? Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. That is a terrifying verse to me. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all those people who choose to disobey him. There is a judgment. There is a judgment. Did you know that? There is no question in Scripture that there is a judgment. There is a, and what's interesting is Paul says that those who practice sexual immorality, those who are greedy, those who are impure, they are, if they live in that, they will be destined for hell, separation from God forever. You see, there's a great lie that has gone on now in the American church, and it really bothers me as a pastor. Can I share this with you? What just absolutely terrifies me is the sheer number of preachers who say, you know, hey, just come on forward here, receive Jesus, okay, and we're, we're going to play a little prayer, and then, you know what, you're going to get your get out of hell free card, and you can pretty much live the way you want, because you know you're going to be on a journey, and God's loving, and, and blah, 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 blah. That, that really is not true. Let me tell you what's true. If you are truly, genuinely a believer, if you truly are a follower of Jesus Christ, yes, it's true that all your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus, but you know what's also true? He will deliver you from your sins. God's not a cosmic enabler. Let me show you some terrifying verses in 1 John that you probably would never see hardly preached in an American church, at least a big one. Here it is. 1 John chapter 3. Now listen to this very clearly. This is the Apostle John writing. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to, watch this, Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. Anyone... Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, don't let any preacher lie to you. Don't let any preacher deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, just what we talked about, it shows that they belong to It shows that they belong to who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God, Jesus, came to destroy the works of the devil so that you can live victoriously. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sin. Because God's life, that is the Holy Spirit, is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are God's children and who are children of the devil. That's pretty black and white, isn't it? I mean, that is painful. That is painfully clear. And let me tell you, John is agreeing with Paul. Those people who continue to live in sexual immorality continue to be greedy, that's scary, continue to be impure in their speech and in their thoughts, they show that they are truly not a believer, and they're going to face judgment. There is a judgment. It's in Revelation chapter 20. Skip, put it up. You, You can look at it. It's called the great white throne judgment. I can't think of anything more terrifying than you end up at the great white throne judgment. And there you're standing before Jesus and all of your thoughts, all of your works, all of your deeds, All of your actions, all of your words, there they are. They appear. And Jesus says, I never knew you. I never knew you. 
There can't be a more terrifying moment than that. Well, now that we're all sufficiently convicted, let's move on to the wise person very quickly. The wise person, put up verse 10, skip real quick. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. So the wise person wants to please the Lord. Let me ask you this question right now. Here's the question. If God were in charge of your schedule, if God were in charge of your day, what would it look like? Have you ever thought about that? If God were in charge of your schedule, if God were in charge of your day, what would it look like? Well, we really don't have to guess. Paul actually answers that question. Skip, can you put up the next set of verses, 15 through 18? So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, Paul says, but those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. In other words, the alcohol will control you and you'll be stupid. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The key, the key to pleasing God, the key, to living wisely is that you and I must be filled, controlled by the Holy Spirit. I have said it before and I will say it again. The Christian life is not difficult. It is impossible. The Christian life is not difficult. It is impossible. It is a supernatural life. And it's very intriguing if you look at the Greek word for being controlled with the Holy Spirit. It's plerumai. And first of all, it's an imperative. It's a command. You and I are to be filled. We are to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's not a suggestion. Now, here's the weird part. It's passive voice. It's not middle voice, meaning that you, you yourself can't do it. It's passive voice. The Holy Spirit himself must do this. It's commanded that I be filled, but I don't have the control over it, it seems, because it's the Holy Spirit who must do it. Now, here... Here you're going to hear something that's virtually never even talked about in the American, and it's sad that's why we're so defeated. Please listen to this last five to seven minutes. It's worth everything to you. There is something you and I can do. This is the key to having the Spirit of God, the very power of the universe, unleashed in you. Listen to me now. This actually, watch me, I can't take credit for it. He's a great Chinese pastor. He said, here is the normal Christian life, Galatians 5.20. Skip, put it up. Watch this. I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, I died with Christ as a believer, but yet I live. Not I, but Jesus or the Holy Spirit living through me. The key to having the Holy Spirit unleashed in you and controlling you and filling you is that you die. The old man dies. My selfish desires, dreams, and goals die. And I allow Jesus and his dreams, goals, desires for me to live through me. That is the absolute key to the victorious life is that you and I must learn to say no. We can actually say no to the flesh. Did you know that? I can actually say no. And you say, well, how do you know that? Why, why are you sure about that? Skip, can you put up real quick, Galatians, I mean, Romans chapter 6. We looked at this before. Do you have Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 7? We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Do you see? When we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. So the, listen to me now. The believer has a civil war going on. You have an old man and you have a new man. But what he, he's saying here is that the old man it wasn't eradicated. It was rendered powerless. My old man, my old flesh doesn't have to control me. Now my new flesh, my new man with a new nature, and the Holy Spirit can control me. So, you know, I have an issue with gluttony. I, I don't have a problem admitting that, all right? So let, yesterday, I, I go to this hunter's thing, or whatever it is, a sportsman thing. They got food everywhere. I mean, I mean it, it's like putting an alcoholic in a bar. And then they have this dessert table like that. See, look at that dessert table. And, and, and seriously, I go to the dessert table. It's right over there, and I'm looking, oh, Susan's not here. She's not going to see what I'm doing. Except I got Jeff and these others actually taking pictures of me. Okay, they did. They sent her pictures. And so I'm looking at this thing and I'm going, wow, I could have this. I could have this. I, you know, and then suddenly, no, seriously, suddenly it rose up with me. Stop. You don't 
have to do that. You don't, Frank, have to do that. You can say no. And I just had two chocolate chip cookies, that's all, just two. <laughs> you know, let, quick, because we're running out of time. You, you got to hear this. Counseling, counseling. See, one of the major mistakes of today's counseling is most of the time, you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to tweak the flesh. They're trying to modify the flesh. They're trying to fix the flesh, and guess what? See, this is why it doesn't work. You, you can't fix the flesh. You can't fix the old man. You can only kill it. No, no, you can only, this is why non-believers, when they go to counseling, it's hopeless. I don't, they, they got, you know, they got addictions on addictions, stronghold on strongholds. You can give them all the great insight in the world, but they don't have the power. See, their old nature hasn't been crucified. They couldn't say no. Do you understand that? Only the believer has the ability to live victoriously, but we haven't understood. I can say no. You can say no if you are truly a born-again believer. Don't let anybody tell you anything differently. Another problem we have in America is that we're emotion-driven. Emo I'm, I'm so tired. I'm just emotional, Pastor. Okay, you're emotional. I'm Italian. So what? All right? <laughs> but let me tell you something about emotions. Just... Just to clear the air, there are good emotions and there are bad emotions. Did you know that? Almost no one will talk about that. Bad emotions are those emotions that stem from your sin nature, your selfish nature. Fear is a bad emotion generally. Envy, lust, bitterness, anger, vengeful spirit. See, those all emanate from the flesh which you can say no to. Those aren't good emotions. But good emotions come from your new nature. See, when the Holy Spirit, my new nature is controlling me, guess what my emotions are? Love. Now, you see, now you're going to get the joy. I have contentment, satisfaction. Wouldn't you want to live that way? And guess what? I, I do agree with the experts that you make your decisions based on your emotions. Most people are controlled by bad emotions, so guess what? They make bad decisions. They make destructive decisions. It's really sad. But that's what's happening to most people. And that's why most people are defeated because they're, 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 they're being controlled by these really negative, destructive emotions. And then they make, you know, and it affects your relationship. That's why our relationships aren't well. And folks, you don't have to live that. See, if you're a believer, now, and, and I'm, this is my last appeal, if you're a believer, you can say no. So, you know, you're going to walk out here. Someone's going to hurt you. I guarantee it. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be hurt at work. Your, your, your spouse is going to hurt you. Your children are going to hurt you. And, and your old man is, is going to want to rise up and, and, and be hurt. And, and, and you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're going to want to get your pound of flesh. Or you're going to want to wallow. One of the worst things that I see is that we got people wallowing in their pain and going back into their pain. and It doesn't help you. It does not help you to go back and wallow and feel sorry for yourself. See, what you can say is, no, flesh, I'm not going to wallow. No, I'm not going to have that vengeful spirit. In fact, I, I say, Lord, I confess it. I confess that I have it. I repent of it. And now I'm going to ask that you would release love within me that you would release love within me and give me the ability to forgive. See, that's the supernatural life. You know what's going to happen, you know, probably sometime this week is maybe you're at work and, and, and you're going to find out that one of your coworkers, they get the uh, promotion and you don't. Uh, maybe you're looking at a neighbor and you're saying, well, I don't get why they get to live so well. And you all of a sudden have this envy. Huh, you know, envy is like just drinking acid. Have you ever, no, it's just horrible to have an envious spirit. So when I have that, when I suddenly get jealous of another pastor, we all do it, by the way, and get envious. Don't, don't deny it. Just say, hey, Lord, that is, oh, wow, that's ugly, Lord. Just forgive me of these feelings of envy. And I'm just asking now, and I just do this, Holy Spirit, just give me joy. And give me contentment. Give me contentment and help me to enjoy the ministry you've given me. The spouse you've given me. The life you've given me. 
See, that's the super, and, and uh, boy, it, it, it just turns in me, just turns in me from negative to positive. No, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's possible to live that way. You know, men struggle with lust. They do. They're just visual. Women don't help the cause, by the way, but <laughs> especially America. Let's see how much clothes we can take off here, all right? Let's, let's test this thing out. But men struggle with lust. But you know what? The smart man doesn't, oh, no, I, I like these guys. No, no, lust isn't a problem for me whatsoever, you know. Give me a break. Of course it is. But I say, Lord, you know what? Forgive me for just making that woman a thing. She's not. See, the moment you confess it, you break the power. Did you know that? The moment you confess it, you break the power. And I said, Lord, it's ugly. I don't like it. I repent of it. I'm asking now that you would just fill me with purity instead of impurity. Fill me with holiness. Help me to see her as a person made in your image. And guess what? It just changes. You break it. it see, this is the supernatural life, and it's possible to live a supernatural life. I want you to know it is po- I don't care what anyone else tells you. It is possible to live your life that way. Now, I don't think you can do it alone. The early church is meeting never. I don't think you can do it alone. See, I think I need someone to help me with my stinking thinking. Maybe you don't, but I do. And that's why you need small groups. That's why you need people in your life and accountability. I run something by and they go, you know, Frank, that, that thinking's wrong. See, that's helpful. And so if you're not involved in a small group in some way, small community, someone to challenge you on it, see me, see Jeff, but, you know, see, you know, see some of the, our women leaders. we got some great women leaders. Please do that. It's important. Because at the end of the life, there's only one question that's going to matter. Did you live wisely or did you live unwisely? Lord, I just thank you for your word. And I know we threw a lot of stuff out here. But I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just begin to do business. That you would help us to walk in truth. So long we've had a defeated mind and we've listened to lies and half-truths. And we're just in bondage. And you don't want us there. You want every single one of us to be set free. You said if the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. I cry out now that people today are going to make the decision. No more, no more gonna, am I going to live in defeat and darkness. I choose now. I'm going to choose this day forward. I want to start living in your life. I want to start living supernaturally. I want to start living in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm just asking even now, have your way during this last song. I ask this in Jesus' name. My heart breaks. It does. It just breaks for the pain that I see in people's lives. And you don't have to live there. You do not have to live there. You can live in freedom. We'll we'll have people up here that will be more than happy to pray with you, to see you set free. Please don't walk out of here continuing to believe lies that you have to live in defeat and shame. That's, That's garbage. It is just garbage. God wants you to live in victory and light. Please take us up on that. Please take him up on that. Like I said, we'll be up here to pray. Please don't forget, if you are interested in baptism, you have really placed your faith and trust in Jesus, then we got a baptismal class for you. JJ will be leading that. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. And, And what I mean by that is, may he plant within you faith to believe that he can make you victorious for this in his precious name. God bless you and take care.